Looking to get quality insurance at a price you can afford? Now you can, thanks to CFM Insurance. CFM specializes in a broad range of farm, home, and rental property coverage. Find an agent right in your local area, as CFM is represented by over 150 independent agents throughout Missouri. For friendly, personal, dependable service from a well-respected leader in the insurance industry, visit cfmutual.com agents and find an agent near you today. This week in Missouri politics, busy week in the political realm, but also a busy week in the governmental realm. We are joined by now former representative and the new chairman of the Labor Industrial Relations Commission, uh, former representative Robert Cornell. Welcome back to the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. It's always good to be here. So you've been on the show many times, talked about many, many issues you've been working on. This yeah. is a new thing. I know, I bet you everybody watching this show has heard of this commission, but tell folks what it actually does. Yeah, so uh, earlier this week, the governor appointed me to the Missouri Labor and Industrial Relations Commission. It's a, it's a three-member commission that's set up, and it's basically like a, an appeals-type court. Uh, it's called a commission, but it's, I would compare it for your listeners and viewers that it's basically an appeals court for an administrative law judge. So if you have like a workers' comp case or unemployment insurance benefits uh, case, and you go into the administrative law judge and you don't quite agree with that ruling and you appeal it, it comes up to the Labor and Industrial Relations Commission that I sit on and been appointed chairman. Now the chair, right? Yeah. Walk yep. in the first day chairman, how, what was that like? Yeah, you know, I would try not to ruffle feathers by automatically <laughs> coming in uh, as chairman, but, you know, I was able to get into the office uh, the other day, you know, the day of the appointment, and I uh, was able to meet with all the staff. Already working and, on cases, I guess? Uh, not quite that fast. Not <laughs> so, quite that fast. Yeah, yeah. You know, still getting uh, my, my badge to even get in the building. Now, you're so. somebody that I, that it was always fun to watch and cover because mm -hmm. you love the legislature. I could tell the legislative process was mm -hmm. something that you absolutely loved. Uh, had to be a little bittersweet leaving the House uh, when you could have served another term if you were elected in the fall. Absolutely. You know, I, I think I left pretty accomplished, but there was always more that I had uh, lined up for the next few, few years. And, of course, I'm leaving behind some good friends and some good relationships that I've developed over the past few years. And it, it's going to be tough. But Walk people through what that's like. When you, you have the opportunity to serve in a position like this, it, it's obviously a great honor to be, a, to be nominated by the governor of the state to, to not just serve but lead one of these commissions. How does that work? Uh, do you get a phone call? Do you reach out? Kind of walk folks through the process and maybe behind the scenes of how you get offered and accept a job like this. Yeah, you know, it, it's something that the governor's office and I have been, had been talking, uh, you know, with the transition about how I could help out the team uh, as best as I could. Uh, and then we recently, the House Republicans, after the, the primary election, we had our House Summer Caucus. And uh, at the Summer Caucus, the governor uh, pulled me over into a private room and sat me down and, and asked me officially. So I was happy hard, to accept. Hard to tell the governor no, I think, it's something like that. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, Governor Parsons is a great guy. Uh, you know, I've considered him a friend for a very long time. I helped him out in you know, his primaries back when he was running uh, for lieutenant governor. Uh, all the way back to the Senate days, you know, he and I were able to get some legislative mm -hmm. things done uh, as a team, and I've just always been a big fan of Governor Parson. Let's talk about some of those legislative things done. You were chair of judiciary, you did criminal justice reform. That's a big thing. What Now that it's been in, in, enacted for a couple years, what are people seeing differently because of legislation that you uh, were a big part of? Absolutely. You know, I think we were able to get some, some big things through, uh, such as we had a juvenile life without parole issue where the United States Supreme Court said some of our laws were unconstitutional. We had to get back in and fix that. Um, we also did uh, pass a huge, uh, pretty comprehensive expungement bill. Mm -hmm. uh, was able to work with Senator Curls with that uh, to get that across the finish line uh, to get some of these small-time offenders back out into the workforce where they can. You really do make a difference in someone's mm -hmm. life when you do that, don't you? Absolutely. You know, yeah. when somebody has to go out and try to find a job, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe they made a mistake, you know, 10 years ago, it's still on their their record. Uh, you know, now they're able to get back and get, be a productive member of society. You know, I watched during your career, there was mm -hmm. almost a time where obviously Republicans run as tough on crime, but there's also mm -hmm. a part where criminal justice can affect economic development. And you mm -hmm. do have a lot of people who are sidelined from the workforce because of relatively small things from a long time ago. It's an interesting thing. You can actually change the trajectory of a family with a piece of legislation. I think that's something that's yeah. overlooked in Jefferson City. Absolutely. You know, and this truly criminal justice reform is something that both sides of the aisle is something that they can agree on to where you know, you're, you're not being tough or you're not being easy on criminals. You're, you know, you're right-sizing the, the punishment with the crime. 
Now, it's an interesting thing to me when you talk about actual impact of people's lives. You've been a part of two tax cuts, mm -hmm. one of which has started to go into effect. You actually see a difference. You've seen at the federal level now, the, the, when you look at the economy and you see the boom, does it not prove a little bit of your theory right of some of the tax cuts you sponsor at the state level when it's enacted in the state and federal level, you see what you see in the stock market? Absolutely. You know, when, when people have more money in their pockets to, to go out and, and purchase things and, you know, gas is pretty low right now and, and able to, to have some extra walking around money uh, to, to buy some things, it's going to help the economy. And I think people can make better decisions with their money more than the, better than the government can. So now you're going to be making decisions. You have to keep uh, some of the erroneous decisions by, like, Joe Kevin in line, right? <laughs> be, Absolutely. Be, finally, you'll be the guy that lords, lords over the senator and gets to overrule him, right? <laughs> exactly. It's funny you mentioned that. I actually saw Senator Kevin <laughs> down in the streets of St. Louis. So I'm, I should have mentioned that to him. There you go. You, well, he probably knew. He, he, know, he knows the process. Yeah. Let's talk about, though, a couple of folks. You're leaving behind mm -hmm. that class of uh, 20 that got elected in 2012. Yeah. Um, uh, good year for Republicans. You had a ton of folks. The Elijah Har, I, I seen you told Missouri Net text you. Rocky Miller, somebody that I know you're close to. Got to be a little bit bittersweet not finishing those last two years. You might, you still, I guess, you still could go run again someday. <laughs> but uh, those last two years with some of those guys that you've got to know very well. Absolutely. You know, uh, Elijah is going to be the next Speaker of the House. He and I not only went to law school together, but we graduated law school together. Uh, we worked on the same legal journal together, was members of the Federalist Society, officers in the Federalist Society together. I mean, he and I truly had a good relationship before. Uh, and even though I ran against him for Speaker, it was something, you know, I didn't think he was going to do a bad job. I just thought I could do a good job. And even after the process, it was an open, honest, fair process. I lost. I'm willing to accept that loss and give all words of encouragement to Elijah, and I know he's going to do a great job leading that caucus forward. I assume your phone won't go too quiet during session with some of the friends you have, maybe reaching out mm -hmm. for a little advice. Absolutely, you know, that's uh, you know what I what I love is and what my piece of advice I would give people uh, coming into the legislature is it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are going to still stick to their principles, but when you have the ability to go into somebody's office, a senator or another uh, chairman, house chairman, or a house colleague, and actually be able to sit down and talk through something that you may have a disagreement on, uh, but you know you're both trying to, to do something, you've developed that relationship, um, you're able to move mm -hmm. your legislation forward, but also the state of Missouri forward, because you're able to have open, honest, fair debate. There's a whole huge senior class leaving, and then there's That's a ton right. of folks in your class, we could, name, we could name half a dozen folks that are leaving the legislature this year for different reasons. Uh, who are some folks that you serve with they should maybe keep an eye on, maybe that we could have on this show, This Week in Missouri Politics? Absolutely. That's what one of the things that I think is great is the class that is coming up behind uh, over the next few years. Uh, there are a bunch of people that are going to be very important to the process. Uh, you know, some of that I would name off the top of my head would be, you know, David Gregory from the St. Mm -hmm. Louis area. Uh, you know, he's a bright, young attorney. Don't hold that against him. but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, he's a, he's a rock star. Um, there's also Cody Smith uh, down from the southwest area. There's also Hannah Kelly from the southwest area. I mean, these are people that are going to be, be leading the caucus now that there's such a huge class going out and a big drain on the brain power. Down. I hold it against him that my daughter thinks he looks like Flynn Ryder. So that's, <laughs> that's the extent of it. Let me ask you one last question. This is a, 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 obviously an honor. You'll be mm -hmm. up for confirmation by the Senate. Uh, but something tells me this isn't necessarily the last time we'll ever see your name on the ballot. Now, I don't want to get you in trouble with Kara or any of the kids, <laughs> yeah. but uh, is, it, uh, is it fair to say that, that you've not totally shut the door well, to elected politics? Well, you know, first I'm worried about the, the job I'm mm -hmm. walking into here. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of good things that I can do here. Uh, you know, but again, in politics, it, it's a funny situation. Things can move quickly. Uh, you know, I was just offered this job last Friday. So, you know, something that if you asked me three months ago or a month ago wasn't even on my radar so you know I would never close the door to that to anything in the future but you know right now I'm just concentrating on my current job. Former representative now chairman Robert Cornell thank you for joining us and sharing your views. Absolutely thanks for having me. We'll be right back Jeff Mazur the infamous J-Maz on the Opinion Maker panel after this. In my state of Oklahoma, since it's become a right to work state, we've lost tens of thousands of jobs and wages have gone down. I lost my job of 36 years. 
Census Bureau and U.S. Department of Labor reports show that in right-to-work states, families make over $8,700 less per year, but CEOs make 361 times the average worker. Prop A in Missouri is, is not what they're trying to sell you. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Looking to get quality insurance at a price you can afford? Now you can, thanks to CFM Insurance. Select from our broad range of farm, home, and rental property coverage. Find an agent right in your local area, as CFM is represented by a network of 200 independent agencies throughout Missouri. For personal and dependable service, From a company with a history of insuring the families of Missouri that dates back to 1869, visit weinsuremissouri.com and find an agent near you today. At Amer in Missouri, we know what light can do. It draws people together and chases monsters away. And if you shine it in the right direction, it will light the path for the next generation, showing them what their tomorrow could look like and spotlighting the possibilities that lay in front of them. Investing in our community by lighting the way forward. That's energy at work. Ammer in Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. Opinion maker panel time. Let's talk politics with Keith Anton. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. Jeff Mazur, Twitter fame, launch code fame. Uh, you got Mindy Mazur to marry you fame. It's very good to be here, Scott. <laughs> Uh, Casey Wheat, head of HRCC, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. And Representative Gene Evans of St. Louis County, welcome back to the show. Good to be here. Let's talk about politics now. We've talked enough policy. Claire McCaskill, Josh Hawley, you know, the race was sort of on hold for a long time. You had an issue with the governor. You've had the primaries. Now it's sort of taken its spot where it's getting the attention that you would have expected it to get. This week, uh, they were attacked Hawley on a few things. Then the Farm Bureau comes out, Missouri Fair Straw Poll, shows Holly doing very well, which is sort of to be expected. But then Claire McCaskill goes on NPR and says, oh, the Farm Bureau and makes a little derisive comment. They're pretty successful at making a big hay of that. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think it makes sense to insult your voters. You know, I mean, there, there's been a, a, a move by that side to insult donors and now insult voters and whole constituencies. And I don't think that's fair to Missourians, and I don't think that's how you win a race in Missouri. Now, Gazer, Claire McCaskill, I've always felt like, has a cadence and a style that is very, that plays very well in Missouri. She does better than Missouri Democrats do overall, and part of it is I think that Farm Bureau member would consider voting for her, but not if you castigate Farm Bureau, right? That's right, that's right. I, I think she did used to fit that mold, but now, you know, agriculture is Missouri's number one industry, and insulting the, the Farm Bureau and all of their members throughout the state, that doesn't bode well with, you know, rural Missouri values. Jeff Mazur, I know you're going to be a consultant for the Eagle Forum Conference next month, but uh, uh, before you get to that, Claire McCaskill is probably the best politician in the state. Sure. And she's always known how. She's from, she'll tell you, she's from Texas County. She knows how to go to Howe County and talk to folks. Sure. It was a little bit off message to go on NPR and be derisive about the Farm Bureau. Well, I think she knows who her voters are. I think she knows that Missouri Farm Bureau is there, and they're going to be where they're going to be. I think, but people know who Claire is. She's been there. She hasn't changed. This is who Claire is. They know her for a couple terms now. And Josh Hawley, very different. I think the reason why this attack on this front is so vociferous by Republicans is because they feel a great deal of discomfort about Josh Hawley and whether or not he really plays to the rural uh, Republican base. And so I think Does the nervousness on that front uh, is what's causing them to uh, launch this attack on Claire. I think that's a fair point. I mean, she does do very well. Now, I think this is a, this is an unforced error that she normally, you don't see her making this before, but I think that is an interesting part. Does Josh Hawley connect? And, and we're talking about, I think people think, oh, is she going to win Barry County? Well, no. Oh, it's about holding down margins. Yes. So it always has been. And, you know, she knows the difference between a trailer and a flatbed truck, and people in Barry right. County may, may care about that. That's a fair point. I mean, Claire McCaskill does, I think, know how to speak to that Missourian who might vote for uh, Barack Obama in 08, or they might have voted for Bill Clinton in 96, but have voted Republican on and off. I think she knows what that person's thinking, and maybe that's right. Maybe that's why she's being attacked here. 
You know, I think that uh, Clara does uh, connect on so many different levels. I mean, she's uh, all around the state. She goes, I think she's done 50, 60 town hall meetings. She'll go. I mean, she spoke in front of the Farm Bureau, and she said, hey, I may not get your vote, right, and or your, your endorsement. But she'll go where other candidates don't feel safe. Clara mm -hmm. goes in places. I see her in places all around the African-American community. I see her in rural Missouri. She will go where others won't go. So my hat's off to her. You know, you're not, everybody's not going to like your Kool-Aid. You know, I do think that's part of her her uh, reputation is to go to the Farm Bureau and tell them stuff they don't want to hear. Sure. I think that's kind of her brand. What wasn't her brand was the misstep, but I've been to those town halls. They're legitimate. She gets asked a ton of questions that are not questions you'd want to have asked. She sits there. She doesn't screen them. She sits and takes people what people have and answers questions the best she can. Gene Evans does Josh Hawley. Now, I, I think folks know him from running for attorney general. Mm -hmm. Those press conferences he gave where he stood up to a governor of his own party, I think brandished his reputation of being pretty independent in his own right. But when he goes to rural Missouri, when he's at the state fair, he worked the state fair for a solid day that I know of when I was there. He, it, can he connect? Are they right? Maybe, they, maybe the Democrats send something there. No, I think they're stretching, to be honest. I mean, Josh Hawley represents rural Missouri values. And one of the things that's important to rural Missourians is their constitutional rights. And he is going to represent their constitutional rights. And in talking about connecting, he was down at our caucus, shaking hands, looking people in the eye, having conversations. That and Branson, right? And Branson, walking around. And, and just a sincere, you know, warm guy. And like you said, he's an independent thinker. And he's going after some bad guys in some different areas. And it doesn't matter if it's in his own party or somewhere else. He's going to hold people accountable. And I think Missourians want that. If he can solve the traffic problem in Branson, then I think he gets elected hands down, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No doubt. Okay, so you have a lot of candidates. A lot of those candidates, probably their main campaigns are primaries. The, these are places in the state that should be Josh Hawley's base. When he goes to those places, like Claire McCaskill has been consistently able to end her whole career to get a better margin in, let's say, a Taney County than most Democrats do. Can Josh Hawley go hold that margin down, or is it just Claire McCaskill's got to go? No, I, I think Josh can, can totally hold those margins down. Uh, we saw, look at the 2016 results. Josh Hawley did phenomenal throughout this entire state, especially in rural, rural Missouri. I think, I think he'll seal the deal. I think it's an interesting thing when you look at, I think the, maybe the key will be, you look at union guys, ticked off in, in, in August against something Republicans did. How do you go, how does Josh Hawley go to those folks say, well, I'm not with you on that, but you voted Republican because guns, abortion, whatever, you just hate the National Party. Is that what you do? You just wrap the National Democrats around Claire McCaskill to get them back in the fold? Well, a lot of union members are Republicans, you know, just mm -hmm. because they didn't like Prop A doesn't mean that they don't like the rest of the platform, and particularly when you're talking about guns. You know, in my district, a lot of union members really value their Second Amendment rights, and, and they see Claire as a threat to that. Jeff Mazur, you got a, you got a guy in Eastern Jackson County, right? He's been voting Republican at the national level. Um, he was very much against Prop A. How do Democrats keep that guy voting for Claire McCaskill? Claire is who she is. She's been there. She's stood and, and stood for those folks. And I think that they know who she is. They're not quite sure who Josh Hawley is. He kind of rode into town on the strength of national connections, Federalist Society, and has just kind of said, I'm here now. And I'm in, I'm in statewide office. I haven't really been around that much, much, but I'm here now. And I think he largely expects to ride that same uh, notion of I'm the Republican on the statewide ballot, and so I'm going to carry the day. But I think the chances are that 2018 looks a lot different than 2016, and so there might be a different outcome on that front. Hey, okay, the, speaking of how 2016 looks different than today's climate, Donald Trump saw, in my opinion, you hear the Russia stuff, and maybe there's something to it, but it's went on a very long time. Then you've seen his lawyer take a plea deal, and that to me is the first real sign that Donald Trump probably does have a serious problem he has to keep an eye on. Is that, is his issues there, is that what's going to trickle in and make 2018 truly different than 16? Absolutely. Listen, birds of a feather flock together and you hang with chumps, you are a chump. And this guy, <laughs> and I'm just telling you, look at this. Bad this, news for my friends. Well, <laughs> this, I mean, at the end of the day, Donald Trump, I mean, he's had 14, 15, 16 people that have been fired. He's had uh, four or five people that have been forced out. There's Playboy uh, bunnies. There's uh, um, uh, uh, strippers. I mean, this is a reality show playing out in our capital. This guy has made a mockery of, of, of our democracy in this country, and it is embarrassing. He's given a black eye. He'll go down as the worst president that has ever served in, in the history of this country. It's quite an indictment, Jeff Major, though. Donald Trump has had a way of sidestepping all these problems, things that they would throw at other politicians. He's like, yeah, whatever. Sure. This goes on. This, but, and, and I think, in a way, the media may make it easier for him by going by DEFCON 5 every day. But when you have your lawyer flipping, that's a big deal. Of course, it's bad. Uh, I mean, 
I'm a lawyer, uh, and I, I know, like you and, anyway. I, and I don't, and, and I don't really know anything about law, but I know that when this happened, that's a bad deal. Uh, when your lawyer flips on you, uh, you know, whatever happens in the long term uh, with Trump and this legal stuff, that's going to happen. I don't think we can predict. I think this is we're on an uncharted territory. Uh, I do think, though, that with respect to the 2018 midterm elections, what we're talking about in places where it was very important for Trump to have huge margins to help. Uh, carry along yes. other people, um, that the, the slight degradation of those numbers, particularly in places where there were pretty close races in some, in some elections in 2016 on the statewide ballot, and if the Trump brand has degraded just a little bit by virtue of this stuff, that may have real impacts on other Republicans who are kind of trying to figure out where to stand uh, in the midst of all this Trump stuff. So I think it's a worrisome thing for short-term politics for people on the state ballot, and I think there's no way that this uh, administration, this term, ends with some kind of happy story about the Donald Trump presidency. And Scott, if I can just add, not only was he his lawyer, but this was a guy that said, I'd take a bullet for Donald Trump. He was his friend, too, and he was his fixer. So this was a closer relationship. Well, now he's a rat. Though. And now, well, okay. Well, he's lying like all the rest of them. Donald Trump has told over 6,000 lies in the last uh, 18 months. That's like three a day. One for breakfast, one for lunch, one for dinner. The whole, the whole pack. He has drained the swamp, and, he, and unfortunately, they've been his friends and family. Okay? Drain the swamp. He's keeping that campaign promise, and I hope he continues. You know, there is something to be said though that when President Trump, he does have a connection to Missourians, there's no question. Mm -hmm. he, he knows how to, Claire McCaskill knows how to talk to those people, Donald Trump does too. Um, but when you do have Omarosa, and it is, it is questionable why you would have hired her, when you do have your, when your lawyer rats on you, maybe you hired a bad lawyer, there is a question of judgment that comes up, I think. Yeah, I think though that most people have already made up their mind about Trump. Uh, I, I, I don't think, you know, people keep talking about the suburban districts. I think in my mm -hmm. district, you, you know, I don't know if he's going to win a lot of votes. You know, he didn't get a 50% margin two years ago. But I think it, Missourians are independent. They vote for candidates. You know, we have a lot of independent voters. We had a lot of Republicans that voted for Prop A. People vote for the person that they think is going to do the best job. And so, you know, maybe they rode, he rode the, people rode the coattails of Trump before, but, I, you know, Ann Wagner certainly didn't. She goes out there and, and wins those as an independent candidate. So I think some of this is overblown. Trump is not a typical Republican. He's an entity unto himself, right? So he's, a, he's almost a character. And I, I don't think his impact is that, people have already made up their mind, it's baked in. Casey Weed, how do you go, you deal with candidates all over the place. You're, uh, well, I'm just a simple hillbilly. You're a big time political professional, but you're from Bon Terre. I am. How do yes. you go to St. Francis County folks that supported Von Terre? Do you sense that changing and does that trickle down to Republican candidates? Uh, St. Francis County loves President Trump um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Jefferson County, we have eight competitive house races in, in Jefferson County. They, the voters there, they still love President Trump. Would it, does it concern you though if somebody likes Trump no matter what he does? Is that a little scary? Yeah, it's certainly a little scary. Yeah. You know, he, that's, that's Scary with anybody. Do, that is an extreme thing. I do think there's a core of people. They don't care what Donald Trump does. They're for him. They doesn't, facts yeah, 30, don't matter. 30%. Absolutely. 30%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Would that be true of the Democrats? If, if it was a Democrat president, would there be 30% of the people that didn't care about I facts? I think there's probably a pretty hardcore 30% base on both sides that are locked in. And it's just about tribalism and the team sport, who, whose letter is on your jersey. Uh, and that's what you care about. But I, I do think that the elections are won and lost uh, you know, in the middle. Well, you know, well I would come, come, come back to Bill Clinton, and I hate when people, you know, drag stuff up from so long ago, but you talk about another president and people all around him being indicted, and he seemed to just skate through. Now, he, he was impeached, but he, he survived that. So I think you do have these true believers on, on either side. Oh, isn't it ridiculous, though? The same religious folks that hated Bill Clinton will make excuses for Trump, and the same people that touted women's rights around Bill Clinton that, that dog Trump will, that was, was for, for Clinton then. Well, it's it, hypocrisy on all sides. Hypo if it, you're trying to tell me there's hypocrisy in politics? <laughs> it's like we're in Casablanca. <laughs> Let's talk about some hypocrisy. You have uh, the candidate for auditor that won the Republican primary, Sandra McDowell. Boy, the media loves to talk about an unpaid couch or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you talk about people that are on a team. They have came after her. I wonder if she was an African-American female Democrat, if she would be getting this type of scrutiny about her personal life. Uh, or if she was a male, I mean, to, to put that out there. Possibly too. I, I just, I think that if you start, um, and, and I realize it's an auditor position, but if you start looking at everybody in office who had some sort of financial trouble in the last 10 or 20 years, you're going to find a lot of people on that list. It's, it's hard to go through the, what we've been through 
economically in the last 20 years and not find somebody who's got some sort of issue uh, in their past. Yeah, it's uh, Nicole Galloway has a legitimate record to run on. She's been an impressive person. I think one of Governor Nixon's, one of the things that makes him look really good about the legacy of his administration is appointing her. She has a record to run on. Is it a little bit, uh, it, could Democrats in the state legislature pass the scrutiny that the media that usually allies with them is uh, trying to put on to Sandra McDowell? Well, I think she's got just just as good a, uh, a chance as Sandra, right? And at the end of the day, uh, I have to agree with the representative. I think that when you look in everybody's past, there's some skeletons in all of our closets, and we've got some things that we're not that doggone proud of, right? And so uh, I think she's got just as good a chance as, as, as Sandra. I, I really you know, do. When I look at Sandra Riddell, I see a person that's taking it head on, right? And it, I, I wonder if there is a bit of a double standard in the way folks are treating her as they might Nicole Galloway. I'm, I'm sensitive to the idea that people have all kinds of things in their history that shouldn't necessarily disqualify them from running for office. Run for state senate. Run for something else. Run Fair for point. state auditor, the one person who's supposed to fly spec the books of the state to look at all the agencies, make sure spending isn't going awry, things aren't being done illegally. That's the office that she chose to run for. And I don't put this all on her either. I put some of this on uh, the Republican in that primary. I mean, primaries exist to ferret out this kind of thing. This information was not new. It just didn't spring up from the earth on the day that she won the primary. Everybody in that race had that information, and they could have avoided this process had they used the primary for what its purpose is, to understand who's the strongest candidate, who's the weakest candidate. Had that stuff been out in the primary, then Republicans may not be facing this issue, and she may not be put in this unfair position where now she's got to defend all these past things. Uh, Casey, we, uh, she's somebody, Sandra McDowell, somebody I think is a good person running for office. I understand that there's going to be attacks, but these seem to be almost like people are taking joy in it. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, Sandra has served her country in the military. She has served her state working as the Secretary of State. She's a mother of five. It's hard for me to pass judgment on someone who maybe had some financial issues during a really stagnant economy. A lot of people were in that situation. Um, I think ultimately the voters will decide. You know, Nicole Galloway has never been elected to a position before. She's only been appointed. Um, the, the primary voters chose Sandra to be their nominee, and so they, they may carry her over into the general. Well, I have this panel here real quickly. Uh, the Supreme Court vacancy seems to be the number one topic. The Republicans want to push in this election. Would Claire McCaskill consider voting for Judge Kavanaugh? I think she should. What do you think? She's going to think about it and do what she think is Would right. Would she be 51, 52, you think? I think she might be. What do you think? I think she might. I think she'll pull it and decide. Uh, maybe. I'm sure, I'm sure that'll be pulled no matter what, but I tend to think maybe she, I don't think she's number 50, but she might be 52. The, the fact that we're going to have potentially a vote on this guy as these indictments come down, he's now in a position where we're going to have to consider his nominees while all this stuff is pending. Seems like a really, really bad idea to me. Seems like season finale of The Apprentice. Uh, while we have a minute left, though, who won the week? I'm going to say the State Fair because I gave you an award, Scott. Well, I love it. Who won the week? I'm going to say Chuck Hatfield who was named chair oh, of the nice. financial services practice at Stinson Leonard. Chuck Abbott wins every week. Who won the week? Uh, Republican women running for the Missouri House. Between Representative Evans having a killer fundraiser this week, Mary Elizabeth Coleman in the 97th yeah. doing really well out on doors, we've got a stellar crew running this cycle. She's a fan of the Blue Owl in Kipswick. Who won the week? I have to say the House Republican Campaign Committee, they broke records uh, in fundraising. We had an uh, amazing caucus, and the person who leads all that is sitting right here. Congratulations. <laughs> I want to say, uh, Mark Wolf and everybody at the State Fair, over 400,000 people come in. Terrific thing for the state of Missouri. If you want to get a feel for real Missouri, uh, go to the State Fair and see how it's outstanding. And we'll see you next week on this week in politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by CFM Insurance, the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank.